Lynn, and I'd like to welcome you to the joy of Yoroi. I'd like to thank the Japan Foundation New York for inviting me to make this video about samurai yoroi or armor. And for those of you that will be borrowing the black suit from the Japan Foundation, we hope to show you how to put on all the pieces and give you some background information of the purpose. So let me emphasize again, I am by no means an expert on this topic, but I am an enthusiast. And my research has been done through books and interviews with kendo and iaido sensei or teachers about armor, martial arts, how things were used, how they work. And it all kind of stems back to Chambara. So I've grown up with movies about samurai, and that's probably why I'm really fascinated in it. I have a big favor to ask all of you. Please help to spread the correct pronunciation of the word samurai. Samurai is derived from a Japanese word, saburao, which means to serve. So the samurai were people that served lords to protect them. Think of three images. First, a saw. Not Uncle Sam. Saw. What does a cow say? Moo. Rye. Like a good Reuben sandwich on rye bread. If you think of it and break it down into those three syllables, you have saw. Moo. Rye. Spread the gospel of samurai. Today, I'm joined by Sakuya. She's going to be our model. Now, sometimes when I dress people up, inevitably I'll get a question, were there female samurai? And I love to answer, of course there were. Samurai family had both males and females in their ranks, and sometimes when the guys are away, maybe off in battle, the women were at the house to protect the property, and they had this wicked weapon called a naginata. Also, they would be experts at riding and archery. If you are interested in finding out more about female samurai, one of the most famous is Tomoe Gozen. For Yoroi, that is the Japanese name that you will hear probably most often if people are talking about Japanese armor. Other words you might hear are gusoku or Yoroi kabuto. Yoroi could only mean the bodice of the armor, and then kabuto is the helmet, but I like to just use yoroi to mean the whole suit of armor. Japanese armor, yoroi, they mean the same thing. To not only protect the safety of the person that will be wearing the armor, but also to help protect our armor. If possible, long sleeves, empty their pockets, cell phones out. More importantly, do they have any metal on them? We don't want someone to accidentally get something caught on the armor or something that could scratch the armor. So there was something called a loincloth or fundoshi that many of the samurai would have worn as their underwear. We're not going to make <laughs> Sakuya wear that today. Oh, it didn't look very comfortable. <laughs> so we're going to start with the clothing. Martial arts today, they wear this kind of top which is called a gi, very similar to the short kimonos that the samurai would have worn on top. There is a right side and a left side, and this is true for all Japanese traditional clothing. When you tie it, please be sure that you tie it with the left side crossing over the right. Some people say, well, what if you do it the other way around? That does exist, but only if you're a corpse. So I always say leftovers are always a good thing. So if you think of that leftover food is a good thing, left over right, you'll always get the crossing of the clothing correct. Again, unless you want to be a dead or zombie samurai. So this is called the hakama, and these are the pants that the samurai would have worn. Any of the martial artists are probably familiar with this as well. It's split so you could ride a horse. So I'll have you step into this mm -hmm. with your left foot first. And if you have access to the gi and hakama, then feel free to use it. If not, it's fine to just put the armor over whatever the person is wearing. Now we're going to start talking about footwear. So these are called waraji, 
They are sandals that are woven out of rice straw. And it said that some people would even measure distances by how long the Waraji lasted. And maybe they would say, well, this is a four Waraji trip because the distance and the timing that it took to wear these out was fairly standard, which is kind of cool. This would have been very common footwear for the samurai and they would have worn it with a special sock that's called a tabi, where it has a split toe. If you look at waraji carefully, you will notice that the part that goes between your big toe and the rest of your toes is way at the end. Unlike a flip-flop, your toes, when you wear waraji, go beyond the end. That adds gripping power. If you have to turn on a dime or make a quick move or run quickly, that's why these are designed that way. There were different ways of tying these, but as long as they stayed on, that was the main purpose. So I noticed mm -hmm. that you put an emphasis on the left. Yes, sometimes when good you observation. Put... Again, this is a journey because I don't have all the answers and I'm constantly learning new things. It was traditional to do the left side first because the left side is closest to your heart. Mm. And so a belief is if you take care of the left side, you'll be protected. Mm -hmm. Whether it really applies to why you cross over the left or the right, that's still up in the air. Now we're going to start getting into the armor. And when we're putting on the armor, it will go from the bottom up. So this is the suneate, or the shin guard. Some notable features about the shin guards, there's this leather patch, which is kind of a throwback to when samurai were mounted soldiers. This would indicate the inside of the leg, so you could quickly tell which was the left and right side. That added for comfort when riding a horse to have leather against your leg and between the horse instead of steel plating. However, on the outside of your leg, that's when you need the protection, and we have the steel plates. And if you look at the top here, there's kind of these cool little knots. I was surprised to find out that behind each one of these little knots is a singular steel plate. So that does offer protection as this part goes over the knee, but because it goes over the knee, you also want some flexibility. So having these free-floating plates tied in, you have protection and flexibility. So again, we have this part over the knee. It's still comfortable to move around, and then the outsides of the legs are protected by the steel plates. And because we kind of bloused the hakama up, she still has a lot of movement, which she'll need when she's in battle. Building layer upon layer, this is called the haidate, and it's to protect the thighs. If we were to wear it like an apron and just tie it in the back, it's going to be a problem because as you're running around, the steel plating is heavy, and you're going to sooner or later have a whoops wardrobe malfunction, which would be the worst thing to happen in the middle of a battle. These two slits on either side of the middle of the haidate are the secret to keeping this up. When you're dressing somebody, make sure that when you put it up to their waist, ask them to hold the top and just keep it in place for you as you come around with the straps and you're going to go under from the back and pull the strap through that slit on both sides. And just that little design feature makes the world of difference because that will prevent it from sliding down. These plates are going all over the place, which is why there are these straps to hold them down to each leg. And it just ties in the back. All right, we're getting ready to go into battle there. So this piece is called the kote. It's the gauntlet and the shoulder to hand protection that samurai would wear. It's a combination of chainmail over the joints, so the elbow and the wrist, Yet to protect the bones, that's where the steel plating will be. You have the solid steel plating over the back bones of your hands, enough chain mail to allow you to open and close your hands easily, 
because you have to remember we are grabbing swords and then good protection on the thumb as well. The left arm was the only arm that used to have protection. Way, way back when the samurai were just personal bodyguards of the daimyo or the lords, they were mounted soldiers. And if you're imagining back then, they had huge puffy sleeves. And so if they were trying to shoot, you can't have a sleeve flopping around. So they would bind that sleeve up with the kote. Whereas the right arm was okay to just go ahead and shoot. So in many of the really old pictures that depict samurai before the 1400s and 1300s, they will only have one side on. What's really ingenious about how the kote was constructed is that it has a special lacing system. You can easily open it wide enough and quickly open it to accommodate the sleeve and then simply by grabbing the two ends of this cord with one pull, it just automatically cinches up. And that's all due to this really cool lacing system. And then when they get their hand through, there's a ring that goes around the thumb and the middle finger. And this ties under the arm. So now I'll tighten it. When they were tying this on, we believe that they would have crossed and went around you can also do a quick tie and just wrap it around and then secure it with a simple knot. I've heard that maybe other foot soldiers or your friends would help dress you if you were of higher rank, maybe your servants, or if you had a wife or a sister, they would also be able to help dress you. But it's totally conceivable that you could have put everything on by yourself. So following tradition, by keeping the left arm on first, when the second gauntlet or kote is added, oh, we've broken the cardinal rule. Now it's right crossing over the left. And so a lot of people ask me about that. And unfortunately, I don't have a really good answer except for we're following the tradition of originally only the left and then later adding the right. Some people have said, hey, samurai were always prepared for death. So this was a way of having that right over left. That's how you dress a corpse symbolism. I'll let you decide which story's correct. So, Sakuya, are you feeling pretty tough now? Yeah, I feel like I'm protected. Because individually, when you're picking up these pieces, they do have some weight because of the plating. But once you have it on your body, it dissipates, and so it's not super heavy. Mm, yeah, it's light. So this is pretty typical for what the samurai could have worn when they were maybe anticipating battle, but not ready to fully gear up. So this is the Okegawa Do, or the Okegawa style of bodice that is two panels connected by a hinge so that it opens and closes like a clamshell. The most notable thing about this style are the horizontal plates. And this would be typical for armor that would have been worn during the Warring States period or the Sengoku Jidai between the 1400s and 1600s. Now when you borrow this set of armor from the Japan Foundation, please note that the pin will not be in place and that's completely fine. And it's actually easier to dress someone in this without the pin. So first start with the back part and come behind your model and put it over their shoulders, kind of like a backpack, and ask them to hang on to it. If you notice on the front, these toggles have to go through the loops on the back. So put the toggle through the loop on the back and then slide this piece down to lock it into place. And now you can say, okay, let go and it's fine, it won't fall apart. And then there are two ways to close it. Front panel over the back, or the back panel over the front. But from my research, different sources, it seems like the back panel over the front side of the dough is the way that it was actually tied. Because if the front were first tied over the back, there's a danger of your enemy being able to grab onto the front panel and spin you off balance. 
and that's something you don't want your enemy to be able to do. However, if the back panel was over the front, they have nothing to grab onto. Another theory is when you're riding a horse, I was told by an equestrian would be more comfortable just because of the sliding motion that would naturally happen. And so the way that this is secured is there's a little loop on the shoulder piece of the doll and simply put the string from the cote through it and then secure it nice and tight so that there's absolutely no chance in the heat of battle for Sakuya's sleeve to come down because that would mean instant death. That would not be good. Here where the ties are, tie our belt on. A simple square knot, tuck it away. Good to go for your photo op. Easy, quick, fast. And something that I will mention if you are using prop swords is that you should show proper respect to your weapon that's going to save your life. So as a sign of respect, you would hold it with your palms up, eye level, and bow to it for respect. Oh, there you go. Please protect my life. More accurately, if Sakuya was going into battle, we would use something called a sarashi. It's a different type of obi or belt. And it's a long piece of white material. Depending on the schools or the time or how you were to tie this, these could be different lengths. Now, as I tie this, I am going to boost the chest plate up a little bit before I secure it to hold up the weight of the dough or the bodice off your shoulders by using the weight distribution to your hips so it's a lot more comfortable. What do you think? Yeah. Does it help a little bit? Yeah, definitely. That's pity. And this is a good time to point out that samurai in Yoroi were not stealth fighters. They make a lot of noise. Okay, Sakuya, try to be sneaky. I still hear it. Yeah, definitely Ninja will find us. <laughs> so continuing on up with the protection, we have the sode, the shoulder guards. And similar to how we put on the dough, it uses the toggle system to lock it into place. So the toggle will go through the loops that are on the dough, and then you pull down the little piece to lock it in place. And so the sode now completely protects her shoulders and some of the uppercuts that might be headed towards the neck. We have the little knots with the individual plates to also help protect these areas. The face and the head, Absolutely, you have to protect, and there are many different ways to do that. Sometimes as simple as like a headband that had maybe some iron plating on it, didn't offer a lot of protection. The blade would be hitting a metal plate and not your skull immediately. But more common would be face guards. This is called the Mempo, or it's a face guard. These came in many different styles, but this one is pretty typical. It's a full face guard guard. It has the plates down here to protect your neck. Nice bushy mustache here. The mouths are open. Teeth are showing because this is going to be your game face. Mm -hmm. And you want it to be as scary and intimidating as possible. Something else that's interesting is if you look at the bottom, there's a little hole. Mm. Because wearing a full face mask gets really hot. So this is for the sweat mm. to drip out. But come on, if you're out on the battlefield, you're gonna get hungry. Mm. And I'm sorry, a rice ball is not gonna fit through that little opening. But don't worry, you won't go hungry. They thought about that. Oh. And now you can eat your rice ball because the nose piece could come off. <laughs> That's embarrassing if you lose it. Battle mode. <laughs> <laughs> The kabuto, our helmet. This is why it's so cool that the Japan Foundation lets you borrow these because this is something you would never see without getting up close and personal. Is inside there is a fabric liner that is sewn into the helmet to prevent your head from actually coming in contact with the metal, which would be really painful if you're riding on a horse and this thing is bouncing on your head. 
Back here is a good view of the movable panels that will protect your neck if someone were to sneak up from behind you. These parts here that come out kind of like little ears were also meant to protect from side blows. Many of them do have this hole. I've been told that um, it's for ventilation. I've also been told that sometimes that's how you can pick up the helmet. More research is probably necessary on that. To protect this fabric cap when lots of different people are wearing it, we ask that when you're trying to dress people up, it's nice if they can have something between them and the helmet. And this would be more traditional to have what's called a tenugui. This is kind of a cotton towel. Many people that do martial arts will use this and it goes on your head and there's different techniques of tying it or maybe something like a surgical cap. Be sure that you check for earrings. You might want to ask your model if they want to pull their hair back because when you're tying on the helmet, there are strings and things. When you put the mempo on, be very careful. It has this sharp point at the top of the nose. So sometimes I will have them go ahead and put it up on their own face and then put the string over their head before putting on the kabuto. Pay attention to the loops when you're putting the helmet on. I'm then going to loop these cords underneath those hooks to help hold up the mask and then go through the loops that are by the helmet to tie this in place. There are many different techniques for how to secure the mask, the mempo, to the helmet, to the kabuto. I just do a bow tie under the chin. In battle time, extra strings would have been tucked and out of the way. This is what I like to call samurai bling because it's a way that they would dress up their helmets with symbols that were important to them. This is the crescent moon. These pieces were removable. Some of these can get really wild. They can be huge bunny ears or large boards. If you're realistically going into battle, they can be quickly removed and it won't get in the way of your fighting. And finally, we'll bring back the sword again showing respect before we put it on. And this is why we have the multiple layers of the sarashi, so that we can put the scabbard in and be secured when they're fighting. Here you go. Ta-da! <laughs> go! Yeah. Ah! So now that you have your model all dressed up, time for some good poses. Have them grab the scabbard with the left hand. With the right hand, resting the fingers on the top towards your enemy. Put your right foot in front, left foot in back. Kind of crouch down. Yeah. Another pose. Hold the sword with both hands. Yeah. So we're going to switch our foot soldier to a samurai of higher rank. They would have a special coat that they could wear called a jinbaori. Beautiful. So people of higher rank would have potentially worn something like this over the armor. And you'll notice in the back, it has a slit for the sword. So again, I'd like to really encourage you to do your own research and we hope that this video will be helpful when you have the opportunity to borrow the Yoroi from the Japan Foundation. Now you can see how we put everything on and teach everyone. Sa, mu, rai. So thanks for joining us on this journey. The joy of Yoroi, Japanese Armor 101.